So I'm going to just give everybody a warning that at the end of this 40 minutes, you're going to give us feedback as to how well I've done. And I hope it's positive feedback, but any feedback is great. Um, so just speaking as um, personally, whenever I get the feedback, I read through it all in detail to make sure I kind of understand how we can improve how things go forward. So as a reminder, I'll try to remember to remind you at the end of the day. Um, very quickly, I thought I should probably put a little bit of a slide as to my background. Two things I'm going to point at. As many of you know, Agile coaches come in two flavors. One of them is super technical people that you want to sit next to and learn from when they code. And I'm the other sort. So um, seismology PhD, lots of background in lots of different areas. Um, and I kind of bring it all together to help our organizations do uh, agile stuff. Uh, I also want to point out here, because I made it a bit bigger, newly minted Canadian. I finally got there. <coughs> so um, and, and now all I have to do is figure out when I can go and get my, uh, I don't know if it's certificate or the handshake or whatever it is now. <laughs> we'll figure that out. Right, so this talk, really where it comes from is when I sit down with a lot of clients and a lot of customers, I often get this conversation. And these are actual quotes from our clients. I sat down with the CIO and the CIO basically said, look, I'm sick and tired of this. Agile keeps telling us, well, we don't know when we're going to get there. And they need to be able to budget. They need to be able to say, look, if something comes in, it's going to cost me half a million dollars or $3 million or whatever that number is. I want to know I'm going to get it uh, at a reasonable pace of delivery. So I need to know when it's going to be. So really, everything that we're going to talk about now is just about how to solve this very specific problem. Um, it's not a difficult pro it's, it is a difficult problem to solve. We'll talk a bit about it. But it's not an unusual problem. Let me put it this way. This is the state of Agile survey. Version 1 does a survey every year. This one here is all about um, the different reasons people do Agile. That's what this slide shows. And what I've highlighted in green that you can see here is what I would consider everything to do with decent delivery of working software. And what I mean is predictable, low risk. I can see it happening in front of me. So you've got everything from, look, I can make minor changes without a big deal. I want to be able to handle change. It's uh, project visibility. Don't tell me we're an agile team. We'll get there when we get there. I need to know where I am on this path towards what I have to get to. Uh, reduce project risk. Um, in, uh, enhance delivery predictability. I need to know when I'm going to get what I'm going to get. Um, reduce the cost of the project. Obviously, sometimes that comes into it. So there are other reasons why we need to know. And I, I think uh, agile teams do themselves a disservice if they say, look, we're an agile team. We, we're going to get there when we get there. And more importantly, because I'm actually going to be spending a lot of time on what the product owner should be doing, product owners do themselves a disservice when they don't work to a commitment. Let me use that word rather than deadlines. I'll talk about that in a sec. And there's three reasons why we care about it. Number one is pure competency. How can we call ourselves a professional delivery group, unit, team, whatever it is, if uh, when I try and say, yeah, we might be able to make 14th of March or sometime in Q1, and then we kind of just shoot past it. We just have a basic level of competence, accountability for that that we have to do. You have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I agree totally with you. I'm on your side. Yeah, I, don't worry. I'm going to shoot leadership in this talk. <laughs> okay? Um, uh, so uh, so I, I'm not standing up here saying we should be doing waterfall. We've got all the plans at the front. What I actually like, I really like it. Most of you will be familiar with Product Owner in a Nutshell, Henrik's video that we all wish we'd made. Right? And in that one, he says, Agile, if you don't like truth and honesty in Agile, you really aren't going to like Agile. And that's really where I'm coming from. And we'll, we'll cover some of it as we go in. However, what I would say is I do think it's reasonable for us to be able to say, look, if I make a commitment, we should have a fair stab at making that, that work. Right? Um, the other reason is just price. I mean, remember, product owners prioritize on return on investment. And if my investment keeps growing, my prioritization mechanism, however I'm trying to do that, fails. 
So there's a need, if forget time and materials, fixed price budgets and so on, there's a need that in order for me to maximize return on investment, I'm minimizing investment. Right? And so I need to be able to manage to that or control it in some way, get visibility into it. And then finally, there's a dependency piece. Now I chose a school bus here very specifically because I think we would all agree if you and I are running for a bus and we miss the bus, it's not a big deal. There's another one along sometime we can pick it up. With school buses, it's very different. How many of us want our kids sitting on the side of the road waiting for a bus that may or may not turn up? Um, that's definitely not something that we feel comfortable with. And the same thing here is dependency management. There are people, there are organizations, there's parts of your teams, uh, your, your organizations or your customers that depend on something. They expect to see it. And we need to be able to kind of meet a commitment around that site. So, as you probably, uh, I was going to say you can tell from my accent, but maybe you can tell from my accent. I'm from Vancouver. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that counts. So I'm based in Vancouver, and, and uh, I have uh, three kids, and we travel through to Calgary regularly, right? We've got in-laws in Calgary. So I travel out to Calgary, and we drive in many cases. So I just want to see this as a project, right? Driving from Calgary to Vancouver. We know roughly what it is. I can go to Google Maps, and I get an estimate. It's going to take me 10 hours and 31 minutes. Has anybody e ever driven Calgary to Vancouver or Vancouver to Calgary in the room? Okay, so you kind of, it's a beautiful drive. Doesn't take 10 hours and 31 minutes, right? Um, but that's a starting point for our project, commitment, whatever it is. I've got a load of things that I'm going to be delivering on the way. Each of these have value, right? They're not milestones. I'm not burning, you know, I've not filled the car up and got all the, the food in the car or anything like this. These are real value delivery on, on the route, right? So I have some idea of what the expected time is for that, where we're going to be able to track progress. This should be where we get to at the start of a project. Now I have a quick question. If you're driving Calgary to Vancouver, um, this is my audience participation piece, right? So my question here is how many people would say they could do that in 9 hours, 31 minutes or less? So there's no race. There's one or two. Thank you. <laughs> there's always a few, right? So we look at that and we go, yeah, we can probably do it. That's my mentality, by the way. But I've got three kids. I have to slow that down a bit, right? How about 1031? How many people would say, yeah, we can do it in 1031? My friends in Vancouver, I'm going to meet you in 10 hours and 31 minutes. How many people? So I'm just doing a rough count here, but that feels to me like 10% of the room. Less than 5% are, are going to try and do it in 9 hours and 31 minutes. How many people here would say 12 hours and 31 minutes seems reasonable? Nice and... Okay, so I'm looking around. That feels to me like around 40, 30% of the room. And how many people think they should make a commitment of 14 hours? Again, another sort of 20 or 30 percent, right? So the, the reason I ask that question is I would ask my Agile, well, well, let me ask a question. How many people here, what would you want your Agile team to tell you? If you're waiting in Vancouver for them, what do you want them to tell you? How much? Okay, so here <laughs> you want the less and less, 931, right? So I've made these numbers up. Ignore that for a minute. What I wanted to point out here is there's two things. Number one is your Agile team should say 10 hours and 31 minutes because their plan that they put together here, and Google Maps, I get their estimates are better than your team estimates. We'll come to that. <laughs> but their plan here says it should take us 10 hours and 31 minutes. So unless they're going to add into that and say, well, you know, we need to stop for petrol and fuel and so on and add a little bit to it, they may do that, but they should describe that. They want, you want them to tell you exactly what's going on. Now, the key is I might want a team to say 14 hours if I've got a really important deadline that I'm heading for. I normally use the example here of a wedding. I decided to suggest Stanley Cup finals being held in Vancouver with Toronto playing Vancouver. Um, <laughs> But either way, if you've got a deadline, you don't want to leave 10 hours and 31 minutes before that final cup game, the Stanley Cup seventh game going all out, right? You're going to want to give yourself space so that you can hit that. So I think the only time when you're going to want to have non, like this is my plan, that's what I'm working to, is if your deadline defines it, if you've got something that you really have to be there. Again, weddings, 
right? You don't kind of slide in at the back of the church at the last minute. You want to be there early. It's polite, all right? The same thing is here. So for the most of it, I want it at 1031, but occasionally it's going to depend on the goal. So I've got a little mnemonic that I've pulled together here for track. The first one is like my, my um, timeline really depends on where I'm trying to get to. Adita talked before this presentation. She had a great comments about deadlines being this kind of bane of things. I cut out all your deadlines unless you know there's a very specific thing you have to go for. And the key that we want to say is, if you're going for that, you give yourself time. It isn't that you fill all that extra time with lots of extra features. Right? But you give yourself time so you can manage risk and change and so on without stressing yourself on that journey. Now, the next thing, as I said, I've been using uh, real-world examples, and I worked with a wonderful company, and uh, they had a PMO who listened to the workshops we did on how to plan your projects, how to get epics put together, size those, and use that to actually get the work done, and they put a lovely little... Uh, flowchart together for me, which was really nice of them. So this flowchart basically says, look, you need to know where you're going, then you're going to write a bunch of epics. Epics are just big chunks of stories, big, big user stories, if you're not familiar with that. You've got to prioritize those. So we have a great mechanism for prioritizing it. Now they've got an ordered list of what they want to see. Fantastic. We're all on the same side at this point. Then they go into some sort of estimation exercise, and this is where it gets dodgy. Right? So one option is t-shirt sizing of epics, uh, using a bit of historical data and so on. I'm not going to talk through estimation. I'm just going to say it's a fair idea. You want to get that 10 hours and 31 minutes identified. Another option is they're going to break their epics into real user stories and do proper estimation, however that is done in their teams, and they'll use that. Not such a fan of that one because that feels like an awful lot of effort to plan your work, but let's work with it. And then we can start plotting our progress to it. So this is a burn, down, uh, burn up chart. And the burn up chart has time along the x-axis, if you're not familiar with this, scope delivered on the y-axis, uh, or a scope on the y-axis. I have my deadline there. That's a green hor uh, vertical line. And uh, I've got real data. So the blue line here is real information that I've got from the team. And I get a lovely projection out. Has anybody used this with a few teams early on in a project? Right? So this is what happens. This is a great team. That's a single team. One of our clients are uh, really doing a great job. Here's what happened with uh, the other team that they put that big uh, flow chart together. This is early on. And you see here their burn up chart. Their burn up chart shows they will deliver their project, which they had to deliver, by the way, in August of 2017, somewhere between 2018 and 2022. Right? <laughs> uh, this is why I was getting all those emails. This is why I was getting all those emails. The thing is that this is right. You don't know what's going on at the beginning. So number one, why would you expect your project to look green for your definition of green at the beginning? Right? So what we, we were combating here is a PMO that, ex that prided themselves on delivering projects that were green all the time. And to your point in the question, which I thought was uh, very poignant here, the whole point is, at the beginning, you don't know what's going to happen. So we've got to start somewhere. And my start somewhere says, yeah, it looks like you'll be doing this for three or four years. But let's just see how it goes, because it's going to get better than that. And we need, I don't know, about a month, four or six weeks. So can we capture that for four or six weeks while we move from what is very clearly a red project, and it gets worse because when I go to my development teams, I find out they're not delivering either. So even that red project, then I find out my development teams aren't delivering. How are we going to handle this? And this is where it gets a little bit awkward for the product owners. So first thing is, again, in my little mnemonic here, remember, red is good. You need red in your project. In fact, any project that starts out green I would argue is either buffered to the hilt or is a lie. And I have to say now, as an agile coach, I call that more often than not nowadays. Okay? I've been a project manager and a program manager. I've done this. I can show you green through and through. Okay? However, we need to see red because red tells me 
that we're missing information. It tells me we have to learn something, we have to go and do something and get better at it. Uh, and so we need to see red and amber or yellow, however you want to look at it, in your project as you go forward. Right? Now, I don't want to see red at the end, but that's one of the great advantages of Agile. You won't be seeing red by the end. It will be green of some sort. We'll talk about how it gets there. But the red reflects missing information. One of the reasons I'm doing this is we've got a couple of clients right now where um, their, their whole organization is geared around being green all the time. And I kind of want to say, well, you, you shouldn't be green all the time. You just want to be red at the right time, which is at the beginning of the project, not at the end of it. Um, so I want to be red where I'm learning. And I think that's a cultural shift that people have to take because a lot of senior management think that you've done something wrong when a project is red. Okay. I'm not going to make it easier for them as we go through, but that's the start, right? Now, the next thing is, this is what normally happens, is my project is red, so I go back to my huge plan and I recalibrate all the epics. So I'm going to look at it now and I've got that plan that says, well, I'm going to be delivering in 2022. So what happens is we now re-estimate all of the epics and the product owner is left with the problem of delivering the same number of epics to the same level of detail in probably a shorter period of time. Classic waterfall challenges, right? So um, I just want to tackle some of this one right now. And this is the purpose of epic budgeting. Here's my epic. And epic's a big user story. So what I'm hoping is when I sit down with the team and they say, yeah, it looks to me like that's a medium epic. It's kind of this big. When I break it down to user stories, the green pieces here, all of those user stories should add up to whatever your medium epic looks like. Right? But in the real world, that's not what's going to happen. In the real world, as a product owner, I'm going to take this epic, whatever that is, and I'm going to break it down into a whole bunch of user stories that will deliver that epic. And in the time that passed when we uh, introduced the epic to when we actually break it down, I've been talking to people and browsing on the internet and using our competitors' products. And all of a sudden, I have more ideas. And when I think, this is what I need, we need this here. I need a toggle here. I need this to look here, look like this. And all of a sudden, the number of user stories to that epic has grown. And this is where, if you're a product owner in the room, this is where I think we kind of go, I hope nobody noticed that. And we kind of squeeze them together and put them in the backlog, and that's it, right? But we can't do that. This is the, if you like, this is the responsibility of the product owner. They've got to figure out how to make this work. And what we want to do there is instead of that re-estimating and just shoving everything into the backlog, we want to proactively adjust the scope. Right? So let me show you in a real example, because I like to use real examples as much as I can. So I'm going to show you what actually happened with one of our customers. So uh, this here, this is, by the way, their, their deadline is quite urgent. They're doing a, a, a website relaunch. And uh, when they do that website relaunch, actually nobody cared when the website went live except for one group of individuals, the executives. Any ideas why that might be? Their bonuses. Exactly. <laughs> Their bonuses were paid out on delivery on August 1st of 2017. Now here's the ironic thing. Nobody told the development teams, right? So the development teams came back with a plan that said, hey, you know what, we, we know we've pushed past the date, but we're thinking September, we should be able to launch. We're pretty relaxed with that because nobody uses the website in the summer anyway. Um, so we're, we're set. And obviously, this caused huge problems because they then found out, or at least they had lots of problems, and then they found out this uh, bonus was in place. So what you can see here is in October, January through to March, um, with, that's our sort of timeline, if you like, and the t-shirt sizing of all our epics. And then on the, the actual column is how many user story points they actually needed to pay to get those epics. They broke all the user stories down and they figured that out, right? So this is the reality. And what you can see, there's lots of variation in there, which is sort of what you would expect. Um, the interesting thing is we've got a whole uh, the small t-shirt sizes, we, we kind of said, look, that's about 20 points. Um, I'm using real data here. So calibrated, the average was 21. The range is 17 to 26. Um, the range for, for medium is 
37 to 62. That's quite a lot of range, right? And we went with 40, even though that's quite low, and you'll see that how that works later on. Large is about 80 points. So roughly we've doubled, one, you know, doubled in this case. You're going to find whatever works for your team. And if you're not using story points, you're counting stories or however you want to do it, it all still is going to come out in the wash as you're going through this. Um, so we've got expected values, which means I can calculate that, that column there. And in actual fact, we ended up being very close for this particular case, but we've seen examples where it is definitely not very close. And when you look at the variance, what you can see is some projects or some epics are way off. The red means uh, it's a lot larger than you think. Okay? So in one of these is pretty much 50% underestimated. Um, if I go, that, and that's the fourth one there. Uh, if I go at the bottom, though, there's a fourth one which is 50% overestimated or 100% overestimated <coughs> according to these numbers. So what you're looking at here is I can look at the variance. And this is my job as a product owner is I've now got to start trading off. I've either got to not deliver all of the functionality in one of those epics. And I've got to stop some user stories, take them out. Or I've got to go and reduce the functionality in another epic so I can build this functionality that I have in my current one. So the reason I call this epic budgeting is because it's exactly like you and I budgeting for the month of September, October, November, whatever it is. We have a certain amount of money at the beginning of the month. And anybody ever familiar with these birthday months where everybody seems to have been born all at the same time? And you go from one birthday celebration to the next and you spend whatever it is that you're going to spend at each one. And about two thirds of the way or halfway through that month, your budget's blown, right? And at that point, you've, I'm from the UK, you'll understand this if you come from the UK, I end up eating beans on toast for the rest of the month, right? <laughs> My budget for normal food has gone out of the window and I'm now on tins and bread and that's about it, right? And this is exactly the same. The product owner has to have this concept of budgeting and of managing those budgets as they go through it. So what we're looking for is I'm going to look at that epic and I'm going to reduce, I'm going to remove, or at the very least put at the very bottom of the backlog, a number of user stories that maybe would be nice to have but don't contribute. Now, can you see any problems with that? Yeah, I'm not going to get the functionality I was looking for. It's not going to be all singing, all dancing the way I was wanting. I get that. So you're going to have to make trade-offs. As a product owner, this is where knowing what your end goal is is so important because that allows you to make trade-offs. And when I sit down with my senior management team, I can have a conversation with them that makes sense. As in, I can say, we've decided to drop these functionalities because they don't contribute to your end goal as much as other stuff does. And you'll get this later on. Now, the website team that I talked about, that's exactly what they did. They traded off um, renewals. So this it's, a, it's an insurance website. Uh, they wanted to get memberships and insurance up there. They didn't worry too much about renewals, so they put that one. And that release has actually gone out in September, October. Right? Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a burn-up chart for another company. This is a gaming company, which is using the same principle. The uh, black line that you see going up there is the product owner team taking user stories to the team and sizing them with the team. These are user stories that are sized. And what you can see in the highlighted bit is it flatlines because the team is continually trading off what they're going to use. And they're throwing stuff away. Now, halfway through that, at the end, it then goes up again. Yeah, they made some informed decisions that they had to add new functionality. It was essential for them to get where they needed to go. But what was valuable about it is that they were able to inform their stakeholders every step of the way they could show that they're meeting their original estimates until they made a decision that they had to add more stuff in there. So coming back to my track mnemonic, the third one here is adjust scope proactively. Work hard to adjust that scope. And I would say this bit here is the critical thing for the product owner to start doing. And I've seen way too many product owners take what I would consider the easy route which is they go into the stakeholders and go, well, you know, the team doesn't deliver as much as I'd like. So this is what we've got, but it's going to push the data out. The team is performing as best they can. 
just out of interest, in this graph here on the far right-hand side, the green line that you see going up is they've got two delivery teams, and it's the sum of their capacity, sprint to sprint. And what you see is that slope is very, very constant. The team is flat out, and they're continually delivering the same amount predictably. I w that's what you want from a development team. I would not, uh, now, yes, I want more. We all want more. My joke is always, I have a son who's 15 years old. As a parent, I want him to do more, actually, any homework, <laughs> right? Um, it's a parent's job is we just want them to do more homework. I can't help that, right? Even if I see them working for hours, I'll still think they could do more homework. That's a product owner with their team's capacity, OK? So we know that, but what we want to be able to do is recognize that if they're predictable, that's pretty much as good as we can get for the moment, right? So adjusting scope proactively, very strongly the product owner's responsibility, and that's something that we want them to take seriously. Now there's two final points I just want to touch on about hitting deadlines. So the f the I would say the, the kind of the big bit in the middle is that product owner adjusting scope as they go forward and very carefully making sure that they're doing the important stuff early um, that they're choosing what they do, not being left at the vagaries of the team's estimates, but proactively managing to those capacities that they've identified for each epic. But there's a, there are two more things we have to worry about. The first one is, if I give updates on my trip from Calgary to Vancouver, and I just tell people how far I've traveled, hey, we've, we've been traveling a couple of hours, we've traveled 300 kilometers or 256 kilometers, that isn't enough for me to know that I'm going in the right direction and that I'm going to get there. I need context around that feedback. And yet we're used to, we are trained in many organizations to tell people how busy we've been working and not what we've been able to achieve and deliver. So when I look at this, this is the company that I talked about that has that website delivering on uh, um, August 1st. And unfortunately, they did all of this on a glass screen, so the photo is a little bit awkward to see. But what you can see there is an S. They do auto insurance, if you've not figured this out, right? So there's a road, and they're starting from the bottom left-hand side of the S, and they're traveling up around that S to their final goal, which is that August 1 release. And on each of their milestones, their deliverable pieces, they have these stickers. This is release uh, 0.1, 0.2, 0 0.6 on their way towards their release. And on those, they have bits of information. One of them is how much of the planned scope is complete. So that's these little thermometers. So they know whether the functionality is all that they needed to. They've, they've kind of got that goal to go towards. The other thing is the number of bugs they have. And I know they're an agile team. They shouldn't have any bugs. But we're working in the real world. They have defects that they have to count. So you can see. Actually, I'll pick some good examples. Two with no bugs, yay. One bug up here, but there are actually more in there if you look into the details. The reason I say that is that information is important for context. So activity doesn't help. Telling people we're busy, telling people, you know, the worst case, how many lines of code you've written is not useful, right? What I'm interested in is, you know, where I'm at, how that impacts our ability to get where we're going to go to next. Now, there's a couple of things that come out of this. This is why I say your, your um, management team kind of has to be on board with this. Because what normally happens in IT world is we go, look, we're at Revelstoke, which, by the way, is about a third of the way in. Um, it's taken me six hours. It should probably have taken three or four hours tops, right? And so we're hours behind. And we won't get to Vancouver until whatever, a few hours after we thought we would. In most IT projects, the response from the people that you're trying to deliver to is what? Make the time up, right? And you can't do that. That's one of the things. In order to deliver decent software that has high quality, you've got to accept where you are. So this is one of the reasons why I use this analogy, because it's something that we all recognize. Making time up on a highway is really difficult. A, um, you're going to run into speed traps and things like that. I don't know why I'm looking over here. I just was, uh, anyway, you've got to watch out because you can't just put your foot down and expect to get the team time back. And the same is true in IT software. 
Everybody knows this from the publication of the mythical man month all the way through. We know that, and yet we'll walk into a meeting and chase and walk out and say, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll do what we can to make the time up. Well, how about we sit down and we say, this isn't going to happen. This is where we're at. There's some brilliant reasons for it, and there's some not very brilliant reasons. Our driver fell asleep when they, changed, you know, when they, they stopped, and we had a two-hour lunch break instead of a 40-minute lunch break. Not good. But there are other reasons why there are things are there. You can have that conversation. So what I want to pick up here is this is really about making sure you're capturing outcomes. You're focused on the right stuff so you can have the right conversations. And that's one of the reasons why I want agile teams to say 10 hours and 31 minutes. Because now I'm going to learn about all the vagaries that go on behind the scenes. And I just want to give you a quick, uh, th this one graph up here is just lo laden with information. Um, if you look at the top, the, uh, this, the first red one is a feature that they didn't have. It's a, it reads land raiding. And it's a game. And they were doing sea-based raiding. So they got the boats going out and fighting one another. And they couldn't get it working. So they switched to, to land raiding, which they could get working. But then the next one is the polish and follow-up. And this is what, in, in uh, gaming, you often call it the polish. This is all the defects. They had no idea how many defects they had to fix. And in games, it's very, very important because if there are any things that slow the game take up down, you basically get rid of the team, right? It, it just, the game dies within three months of launch. So they have to get that right. They had no idea what was involved. But that's that if you capture the right stuff, you capture the outcomes, not the activity, you can learn from it. And if you're measuring at 10, 31 hours, uh, 10 hours and 31 minutes, instead of my buffer, I can learn my real expectation for future projects of, for example, how much cleanup we need, or this proverbial hardening sprint, but we're going to address that in a second. But just the how much extra time it takes, for it, maybe for feedback. Your business doesn't respond quite as quickly as you were hoping, and so it adjusts where you're going from that. So that capturing outcomes against activity, against a timeline, that is realistic, that is really based on the estimates and not, you're not being held to account for that, but it's something that we can learn from is important. So that was the first thing. The second thing that we want to worry about, and this is probably one that uh, if anybody works with me, they hear about this all the time. This is to do with if, whenever you're doing this sort of agile progression over time, if you don't release shippable software, like, I don't mean release to your customer. I get it. You might not push it out to your customer. But it has to be on an environment which is as good as your production. So pre-prod or staging, something like this. If you're not releasing stuff that you can go and interrogate on this pre-prod or staging environment, you're kind of living in la-la land. You don't know where you're at. And the example I look at, I've got a picture here of a nice icy winter road, which if anybody's driven that Calgary, Vancouver in winter, I can highly recommend it. It puts your adrenaline right up um, at night. Now imagine you're driving on these roads and you shut your eyes. Right? How long before you're going to open your eyes again? Right? Milliseconds. milliseconds. When I'm driving that one, I'm sitting there like trying to keep my eyes open the whole time, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen. When you shut your eyes, that's the equivalent of your development team saying, oh yeah, we released yesterday and we'll release in the future. And the longer you wait, the more nervous people get. Right? You, I've, you're you're going to be in that situation where you're just driving and you don't know what's happening. So opening the eyes is the release. And you want to do it frequently, a lot. You want to be more released than not released, if you use this as an analogy. So. <coughs> Um, always be delivering uh, releasable increments. You've got to be in that frame of mind. So here, for example, is that real live project that I talked about. They were going to release their first cut in March. They were very excited about it. And then their product owner went a little bit crazy and kept adding functionality on. And eventually, if you remember, the, the leadership got really upset because their bonus wasn't going to get hit. That was about mid-May. Mid so we have this conversation with them, early May or mid-May. And we figured out we needed a couple of sprints to get onto a pre-production environment. So we went from red because we didn't know where things were. And we gave them a couple of sprints 
to figure things out and get their pre-production running so that they were ready to launch mid-June. Now again, this is the real world. Did they achieve that? No. It was sometime in July, right, when they got that together because there are always things going on. But what they ended up with is a release that they were able to get out um, early. They actually launched it three or four days earlier than their 1st of August deadline so everyone could go home for the weekend. Um, and secondly, it was one of the most relaxed releases I've ever seen because they'd had at least two, if not three, releases prior to that where everything was working and they were just adding a little bit and cleaning up. So, and when you're looking at that release frequency, remember that closing eyes on the road. When you close the eyes and when your team says, you don't understand it, it's complicated, we need to do this, this is like playing chicken on the road. You can go, yeah, fine, I don't care, I need you to open your eyes regularly. So let's start looking at that and open your eyes again, okay? So uh, this is where, when I talk about experiences delivered, not worked on, I want to show, look, this is what we've actually got running. This is what our users can do today. I don't want to just say, look, we've been busy working on this particular buy flow. It's nearly done. It doesn't wash in this particular world. So that final thing is know where you are, right? So that mnemonic track is... Uh, Timeline, you depends on your goal. Uh, I want to red, just accept red early on, right? Um, but again, recognize that it should all move to green. I think this is a really nice example of that, where the team really began getting control over what they were doing. Uh, adjusting scope proactively, that's really the purpose of this chat, it's for the focus on product owners. Uh, capture outcomes and know where you are. Okay, so I'm going to um, pause it there. Uh, any questions? As I do that, I have a couple of books and things from Agile 42. Uh, feel free to come up and grab one of those uh, after the talk if you'd like to before you disappear for lunch. And a reminder again so that people smile at me from the back of the room. Uh, your feedback forms would be very, very welcome.